Hi, welcome to this video from Zimmer and Peacock about square wave voltammetry waveform, differential pulse voltammetry waveform, and normal pulse voltammetry waveform. Now, this um, video is deliberately titled Waveform because once you start digging into these techniques of um, square wave, differential pulse, and normal pulse, you start realizing that each one of these requires a really extensive multi video. Um, service basically and um, so this one we're just going to touch upon waveform as well later on I want to actually do experiments and embed those into the videos and I also want to do you know pros and cons of each particular um, waveform and its use in electroanalytical chemistry but let's dig into this video and it'll be a short one but we'll specifically focus on the waveform today as well though I will spin finish with um, a comment also on um, really sensitivity of these different um, tests as well so first of all, um, can I just say um, to like if you like the video and um, please um, subscribe as well. And please f add any comments. This video is kind of made in response because we've been getting some feedback um, in the comments saying, okay, well, you know, we liked your video on cyclovoltammetry. We liked your video on charging current, but now we want to start getting to square wave differential and normal pulse voltammetry. These are really interesting. Once you start really digging into it a little bit deeper and you really start thinking about it, um, so let me go on with the video, but um, I want to say that we will do more and more videos um, around this subject. It can't be done just fairly quickly. So first of all, of course, you know, um, there's lots of electroanalytical techniques out there, amperometry, voltammetry, potentiometry, um, and for example, um, impedance spectroscopy. But today we're just going to focus on um, the voltammetric methods. Um, I know I've said it before and I'll say it again that, you know, these techniques if you're doing a sort of modern electroanalytical chemistry or you're interested in biosensors and sensors that are electrochemical, just know that this kind of electronics that drive these are very small these days. And I say it because it's a shame when people use these large bulky potential stats because it really masks what a powerful um, technique this can be um, and it can be applied in the real world because of the size of the things like the electronics. Um, in terms of voltammetry, um, the only reason I put the subscribe button back up there is because I've said it already, but I think we're going to do a series of videos about actually doing these experiments online and um, you know demonstrating them done. But linear sweep voltammetry is obviously a technique in the voltammetry, cycle voltammetry, um, square wave voltammetry, which we will talk about the waveform today, differential pulse voltammetry, um, which we will talk about um, normal pulse voltammetry. One that won't be touched today is reverse pulse voltammetry. And there's also a differential square wave voltammetry, which um, one of my academic colleagues is also spearheading um, as well. As I say, we have um, touched upon um, um, linear sweep voltammetry and cycle voltammetry in some previous videos. So, you know, don't think that this is ignored, it is covered. Um, we might touch upon it a bit today, but I want to sort of focus more in on the... Um, DPV, NPV, and the SWV um, today. Um, now, why do these pulse methods of voltammetry kind of exist? And they exist because they really try to overcome um, something that um, my academic colleagues perceived, which was, you know, there was a problem when doing electroanalytical chemistry. You know, we have an electrode, that electrode's sitting in a solution. Um, you know, here we've got this Fe3+, plus, oh, sorry, Fe2+. Plus, you know, we apply a, um, a voltage and we get um, the conversion of some of the um, Fe2 plus to Fe3 plus. Great, that's what we want. But we also get a um, sort of secondary effect, which is um, something called the um, charging current. And people sort of say, all right, well, that charging current is not the useful signal. So lots of these um, pulse uh, voltammetric techniques, and by that, you know, today, square wave voltammetry, differential pulse voltammetry, normal pulse voltammetry, they're sort of intended to um, reduce the effect of this um, charging current because you want to be left with the Faraday current. I have a video playing up in the up, up here, which um, is one that you can find online as well. We specifically do a video about this, and that video alone is 10 minutes. So these um, pulse techniques, SWV, NPV, DPV, they exist to try and um, eliminate um, the charging current effect and if you're not sure about charging current please watch the previous video so they want to emphasize this faraday current um when you really study these methods or look into these methods a bit more you realize you know people want that faraday current but they don't want that charging current and so there's actually two strategies going on um there's timing so 
for example, in amperometry, um, there is a timing where actually rather than just recording the current in the first few milliseconds, you record the current later on. And your assumption is that if the longer you leave the current, then the less effect you have from the charging current. And so the strategy is don't record the current immediately, delay a bit, expect the charging current to have kind of dissipated. And then you can just measure that Faraday current, which is assumed to be the useful um, current. And that's what they do in linear sweep voltammetry, cyclic voltammetry, and um, normal pulse voltammetry. Um, again, watch some previous videos about LSV and CV. Um, and today I will cover um, NPV, this normal pulse voltammetry. The second strategy that's kind of being used is timing and subtraction. So the first part of this is similar to, um, you know, if you delay the recording of current, um, you can let the charging current dissipate and then you're left with that Faraday current. But also you do a subtraction um, as well on the signal. Um, and I'll um, emphasize what that really means um, in a bit. But there's two strategies. So um, electrolytical chemists, when they're thinking about pulse voltammetries, etc., they think, look, I want the Faraday current. I do not want this, what they consider non-specific charging current. And so they can get rid of it or diminish it by just delaying the recording of current, or they can do it by delaying and trying to subtract the charging current. And so um, it's probably worth saying that the second strategy is used in um, square wave voltammetry and differential pulse voltammetry. Um, so you won't hear people talk about these two strategies so much. They're just kind of inferred. But I realize actually there are two strategies being used. And um, LSV, CV, and NPV are using really the first strategy. And SWV and DPV are using um, the second strategy. Which you suggest the second strategy is more sophisticated, but the question is, does it give you any more advantages? Um, which I haven't answered, and I think we'll answer it through videos and through experience. Just touching on linear sweep voltammetry, I have, um, as I say, um, have run a previous video on this, so I won't run that video um, again. But in linear sweep voltammetry, they kind of use that timing strategy where they don't... Linear sweep voltammetry these days, you know, has this kind of staircase potential profile because... Potential stats are digital, they're no longer analog, so you have to apply a sweeping voltage in a stepwise manner. Every time you change voltage, you get a charging current, so you don't record the current at the beginning of the um, step. Let's say you wait until the last sort of, 25 seconds, or sorry, 25% of the time period, and then you record the current. So um, the current um, jumps up, it starts to essentially relax, um, and then they record the current. The current jumps up, it starts to relax, then they record the current. So this is what's going on um, in most potential stats. Um, and you're not necessarily even knowing that that's what they're doing, but in fact, that's what the potential stat um, is doing. Let's get to the meat of this. Now, don't forget, I did say that this was really about um, square wave voltammetry waveform. Um, and because I think the benefits and the implementation require more and more videos um, in their own right. But I will dig into the waveform a bit. So the same as linear sweep voltammetry, uh, modern potential stats, you know, they can't apply true analog voltage sweeps. Everything is digitized these days. So we have this kind of um, staircase um, potential. But on top of that, then, is really is, is um, superimposed a, um, a square wave where the voltage goes up, the voltage goes down, the voltage goes up, the voltage goes down. But there's a general upwards... Um, in those voltages um, and what's happening there is um, we have a, a resulting current but remember I said that square wave voltammetry used um, timing as part of the strategy so they're not recording the, the current throughout that those voltage plateaus they're actually recording it only in certain parts and actually near the end of the plateau because then they assume that the um, charging current is um, dissipated so this goes on um, for each essentially um, step that the um, current is recorded. You can see that really there's two things going on here. There's, there's one at the top of that peak and there's one at the bottom of that. And I'll explain that um, shortly. So what's happening is um, the um, in a square wave voltammogram, the voltage is generally being swept up, but it's being stepped up, stepped down, stepped up, stepped down, stepped up, stepped down, stepped up, stepped down. Stepped up, stepped down. And for each one of these, then they, um, a current has been recorded. So you actually end up with a 
data set for all the and I'll label this up in the minute all the forward scans and you also get all these um, currents for the backward scan um, so the forward scans is sort of called the anodic plus non faraday current in this case or and the cathodic plus non faraday current um, on those essentially bottom of those um, steps so we've got the forward and we've got the reverse um, which I've labeled up here so what they do, and it's quite neat in square wave voltammetry. Now, your potential stat might be doing this and you don't know it. Um, but what it's doing is it's actually subtracting um, the reverse from the forward and giving you a net delta current. So delta current is equal to the forward minus the reverse. And so you get an enhancement, essentially, in the sort of Faradaic signal. But the assumption is that you've... Um, subtracting non Faraday current and you're subtracting non Faraday current from it um, so you end up um, losing the non Faraday current signal um, as an assumption you know um, how well that really works I think depends on the particular system that you're testing but that's the theory and that's in practice square wave voltammetry for example relative to cyclovoltammetry and this is direct experience is let's say more sensitive um, than cyclovoltammetry and I would also say more specific as well so experience says it does work I'm just being you know also being um, a pragmatist that just because you know you've got this forward um, current which is the anodic plus non-faradaic and then you've got this reverse which is cathodic plus non-faradaic so you if you minus um, the cathodic from the anodic then yeah you, if you assume that the background was the same both times then yeah it should be eliminated because that is an assumption and but I think it, it does hold up a lot of the time, let's say. So not a bad um, assumption, but you should always know there's an assumption being made there. So that's the waveform for square wave voltammetry. And I think it's fair to say that um, square wave is, um, for us, more sensitive. So it gives us a better limit to detection um, than cyclovoltammetry. Um, the waveform for different differential pulse voltammetry um, is fairly similar. Um, that, again, potentially starts um, these days, they don't have the ability to do sort of a true analog sweep. They're all using this kind of staircase potential. Um, over the top of that, um, pulse voltammetry applies a similar waveform to um, square wave voltammetry, but um, it's not exactly the same. Um, but it's using the same kind of principle that I said. There were two strategies being used in voltammetry to remove the charging current. The first strategy is timing. So they're not recording the current necessarily throughout that potential um, step there. They're actually just recording it approximately in the last sort of 25% of that. Um, and we call that the IF and um, there's also the IR and it's similarly being um, recorded in the last 25%. So they are using that timing strategy, but they are also using the subtraction strategy. So the Delta I in differential pulse voltammetry is a really similar uh, comes from a similar place as in square wave voltammetry, IF minus IR. Um, so that's kind of using that strategy of timing and, let's say, subtraction of the non Faraday current, which is really similar to square wave voltammetry. Um, now, normal pulse voltammetry is different. I think normal pulse voltammetry is more like um, linear sweep voltammetry um, in some ways. Um, you have a series of, for example, increasing... Um, pulses of voltage um, and you get a resulting um, current um, for each one of those voltage holes now what's happening is um, again they're re not recording at the um, beginning of that pulse because that's where the, all the sort of charging current is they're actually recording more near the end and they plot that out so that's sort of similar to um, linear sweep voltammetry um, so what can I say then? So we've um, today we wanted to touch upon or um, we'll start to introduce three types of hyphenated voltammetric techniques. That's square wave voltammetry, differential pulse voltammetry, and normal pulse voltammetry. Today I only wanted to touch upon the waveforms, um, but I just want to kind of talk about the sensitivity because I've seen this lauded as a really good metric. That if you, for example, um, measured um, ferrocyanide using cyclovoltammetry, you might get a peak current or a limiting current and we'd give it an arbitrary value of one. You might find that differential pulse voltammetry might have a um, peak or limiting peak height of two, which in some way says, oh, look, 
Differential pulse voltammetry is twice as sensitive as cyclic voltammetry. Square wave voltammetry is three times as sensitive as cyclic voltammetry. And um, normal pulse voltammetry is maybe six times as sensitive. Now I ask people to subscribe to this channel because I'm actually going to get, we're going to go into our lab and we're going to do this and we're going to record this and actually check this out. It's a different matter, but I do have something on the website about the glossary for terms for biosensing because the question I ask myself here is, yeah, you might get greater sensitivity, but is it giving you, for example, the limit of detection ad um, advantages that people are looking for? I think the answer is they do. Square wave voltammetry and differential pulse voltammetry do give you better limit of detections, for example, but, um, and it's claimed and there's lots of, there's lots of um, papers about it, but I think we need to go in the lab and really prove that out as well. So let me summarize what we've said today. So today I wanted to respond to some of the comments that have come in previous videos and people have asked us to start talking about square wave voltammetry and differential pulse voltammetry. Um, we've only introduced, I would say, the waveforms today, and we've also introduced the waveform for normal pulse voltammetry. But I do want people to subscribe because I think then you'll be able to see, um, subscribe and also turn on notifications because then you'll start seeing us actually start to do these experiments and put up recordings of us doing this and start putting some experiments around also the science and the claims around these different um, techniques. So I want to finish with saying thank you. Look, put your comments in below. This video is in direct response to some of the comments that just came out on our charging current um, video and also on our linear sweep cycle voltammetry um, video. So we do read the comments and we do start to put together materials to answer those questions. So it leaves me just to say, um, subscribe and turn on notifications because we will do those experiments with, for example, something simple like ferrocyanide and we'll start posting those. So it leaves me just to say thank you so very much. Um, leave any comments and um, you'll find out ZP were very responsive and we will read those comments and um, try and add some scientific value to the community. Okay, thanks very much. Appreciate it.